are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson award-winning volunteer and chapter leadership committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Jeremy. That was a nice introduction. Thanks. This is episode 101 of Lighthearted, slated for February 1st, 2021. In lighthouse history, Point Pinos Lighthouse in Pacific Grove, California, was first lighted on February 1st, 1855. It's the oldest continuously operated lighthouse on the west coast of the United States. The best known keeper at Point Pinos was Emily Fish, who served from 1893 to 1914. She was known as the socialite keeper because of her love of entertaining guests at the lighthouse. Also, tomorrow is Groundhog Day. Cindy, do you happen to know anything about the origins of Groundhog Day? As a matter of fact, I do, thanks to you. The idea was based on lore brought from German-speaking areas where the badger is the forecasting animal instead of a groundhog. It seems to have developed from the belief that clear weather on the Christian festival of Candlemas on February 2nd means there will be a prolonged winter. Today, the tradition is observed in the U.S. and Canada. And, of course, the Groundhog Day capital is Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, where the celebration centers around a groundhog named Punxsutawney Phil. And by the way, no studies have found correlation between a groundhog seeing its shadow and the arrival time of spring-like weather. Of course, the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray is a classic. I've read that the director's first choice to star in the movie was Tom Hanks, but he turned it down. He felt that audiences saw him as a nice guy, so the character's redemption in the movie wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, I've probably seen that movie at least 10 times. I think it's a classic. I could keep talking about Groundhog Day some more, but we should probably move on. We should probably talk about lighthouses. So moving on to our main subject for today, we're going to Ireland, sort of. We'll be hearing part one of a two-part interview with Richard Cummins, a former lighthouse keeper in Ireland. He now lives in Southern California, which is why I said we're sort of going to Ireland. Cindy, please tell everyone about Richard Cummins. Sure, Jeremy. Richard Cummins is a native of Ireland who, for about 10 years, ending in 1989, worked as a lighthouse keeper in that country. He spent time at the very famous Fastnet Rock Lighthouse, at Hook Head, the oldest operating lighthouse in the world, and some other well-known light stations, more than 20 in all. After his time as a lighthouse keeper, he's worked as a photographer, and his photos have been published in National Geographic and other publications. You can see Richard's photographic work online at art.com and many other websites. He's also known for the remarkable ships and bottles and other nautical models he's built, which you can see on his Facebook page. As I mentioned, today we'll hear part one of a two-part interview. The second part will be released in two days on February 3rd. So let's listen to part one of my conversation with Richard Cummins now. I am speaking with Richard Cummins, who was an Irish lighthouse keeper for about, well, he's still Irish, but he was a lighthouse keeper for about 10 years, ending in 1989, and lives now in Southern California, near San Diego. How are you doing, Richard? I'm pretty good, thank you. I'm envious of uh, where you are today, because I'm here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we've got about a foot of snow since last night, and uh, somehow I don't think you've gotten a foot of snow in, uh, near San Diego lately. No, we had a little bit of frost a few nights ago, if you consider oh, no. that. What a scary thing. <laughs> I hope. So I'd like to chat today about your experience at Irish Lighthouses. We had a good phone conversation about it, and I've been looking forward to speaking with you more about it. So first of all, you became a lighthouse keeper at the age of 18, but your love of lighthouses started before that. How did you first get interested in lighthouses? Uh, when I was a young teenage boy, my brothers and myself went deep sea fishing. My dad used to take us out fishing. So I saw the bull rock and the fastnet in the distance. And I became absolutely obsessed with lighthouses. I mean, if I know people worked on them, it was like a light bulb went off in my head and I decided I wanted to be a lighthouse keeper. 
I had no idea what the job was or what you did, but it just appealed. Those are great lighthouses. Fastnet is one of the most spectacular lighthouse locations, I think, in the world. Let's talk about the commissioners of Irish Lights a little bit. What's, what's the scope of their authority? They cover Ireland, obviously. Do they also cover Northern Ireland? Yes, they cover the whole country. When the country was partitioned way back in the 20s, uh, Irish Lights made some agreement with the British government that they would look after the lighthouses in the north of Ireland. And actually, the British government subsidized the Irish Lighthouse Service up until the 1980s mm-hmm. because shipping dues didn't cover the expenses. And uh, it was Margaret Thatcher's government when she discovered this. She was trying to make cutbacks in Britain. She decided the Irish should pay for their own lighthouses. We didn't like that. <laughs> Obviously, there's no Coast Guard in Ireland like we have here in the the U.S. Did lighthouse keepers have to fill uh, certain roles that the Coast Guard might fill in other countries? Yeah, we didn't have to do it. Uh, We did a lot of voluntary work. We worked with the customs, the police, pollution monitoring, rescue coordination centers, the weather service for taking weather reports. Because there was no Coast Guard, we were actually the only eyes on the coast. Back in those days, you didn't have cell phones and things, so the only way of communicating was through lighthouses and their radios. And we used to pass on calls for yachts and stuff when they were delayed to let people know they were okay, things like that. When you became a lighthouse keeper again, uh, you were 18, am I correct in saying you were 18 when you became a keeper? Yes, a long time ago. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's not quite as long ago as when I was 18, but uh, so what kind of training did you have uh, to become a lighthouse keeper? Initially, most lighthouse keepers trained like apprentices at the Bailey Lighthouse in Dublin. But for about 20 years, the new keepers went to a training school in Dunleary in County Dublin for six months. It's a maritime training school. And when we were there, we studied um, engines, optics, fog signals, radio communications, rope work, helicopter and boat operations, firefighting, first aid, and things like cooking and basic hygiene. What were the basic duties at the time when you became a lighthouse keeper? What were the basic duties uh, at these light stations? Your main job is to operate and maintain navigational aids. And the most important one was usually the light, followed by the fog signal. Uh, We had some stations at radar beacons, others at radio beacons, and um, the rest of it then would have been painting, equipment maintenance, polishing brass, and collecting rainwater was a vital thing. So when it rained, you would leave it rain for about half an hour to wash off the roofs of the buildings, taste the water, and if it didn't taste of bird dirt and salt, then you'd open the tanks and let them fill up with rainwater. Uh, I've heard of similar systems in this in the U.S., but I just interviewed a Coast Guard lightkeeper who was at a main station in the early 70s, and he said they they'd never did anything like that as far as uh, letting the, uh, the, you know, the water clean off the roof before it went into the cistern. The water from the moment it started raining would just go directly into the cistern. And he said they didn't worry too much about it. They just drank a lot of coffee. And I guess that covered up the uh, whatever bad <laughs> taste there were in the water. But I was, I was amazed that he uh, told me it wasn't filtered or anything like that. Our, our water wasn't filtered. It was basically... You just tasted it, and if it didn't taste too rancid, you let it go into the tanks. Mind you, when you're a young keeper, you don't know what's rancid and what's not because all the water tasted pretty foul. <laughs> but you learn pretty quick because the principal keeper would slap you across the head if you screwed up and ruined the water. <laughs> yeah, so if it tasted especially foul, you didn't drink it. And we used to have to sort of keep have catchment areas, if, and depending on the stations, with concrete catchment areas where you catch water. You would paint it white to kill all the moss and everything like that, and you would make sure it was kept clean of any debris. But some stations didn't have enough water. They never had enough water because you had only a tiny area to collect it. Tower stations, for example, places like the Fastnet, the only place you can get water is from the dome of the lighthouse, which is actually quite small. Therefore, plus the dome is painted with lead paint, which probably wasn't the safest thing for us, but we're all still alive in here. Uh, how did you, uh, you were at some pretty remote stations during your keeping lighthouse keeping career how did you communicate with the mainland and uh did did you also communicate with other lighthouses we used to use radio telephones for communications between lighthouses we had regular radio calls for safety checks and to pass messages three times a day if there was a message coming for a particular lighthouse it would be sent 
to the first lighthouse in Dublin and passed from station to station over a, a day or two until it finally reached where it was de its destination. Hmm. That's how we got messages. Um, we also had VHF radios for talking to ships. We had a special radio then for helicopter operations. Uh, some of the stations had phones where you could phone home or phone ashore. That was very spotty and it was open to anybody who wanted it with a radio to listen in. So you had to be very careful if you were making a phone call home, if you said anything personal, the whole world knew about it. It was just a direct dial system, right? You could just call call anywhere with those phones. Pick up the phone and it would link with a, an operator ashore and the local telephone exchange and she would ask you what number you wanted and she would just connect you. It was okay. the old days before cell phones. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember phone operators. Uh, you told me you were not stationed at any particular lighthouses for extended periods of time, that you traveled around and spent time at, uh, I think you said, uh, just about all of the lighthouses in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Is, is that is that correct? Yeah. When Normally, when a new keeper gets trained, you're called a supernumerary assistant keeper. It basically means you're used as a relief keeper to fill in around the coast. After about two years, then you would get a permanent station. But due to automation, I never got a permanent station until the last year in the job. So I went from station to station. So every man station there was when I was in the service, I was on, which was fantastic because you got to see them all and meet everybody. I'm wondering, uh, was there friction of any kind with keepers uh, going to work uh, in Northern Ireland? Yes, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, basically, there was keepers in the job that lived in the north of Ireland and were Protestant. There was keepers who were in the job and were from Southern Ireland and were Catholic. And there was a little friction with some of them. Some of the northern keepers wouldn't go south. Some of the southern keepers wouldn't go north. So you had an option when Irish lights would transfer you. You could refuse to go because it was quite dangerous at times for a southern keeper to be located in a lighthouse in a predominantly Protestant area. Because uh, with our accents, the people knew exactly where you came from. But once people knew you were a lighthouse keeper, I never had any problems. You didn't discuss politics, religion, or the state of the world with any of these people. You just talked about the weather and fishing and boats. And Obviously, you had more in common than you didn't have in common. Than you yes, did. that's the way it was. Uh, you spent time at Fastnet, which uh, I would say is one of the most famous lighthouses in the world, one of the most rugged stations in the world several miles from the southern end of Ireland, out in the Atlantic Ocean. So what was that like? Working in the fast, it was uh, what I would call real lighthouse keeping. It was an amazing place. It was um, frightening, thrilling, amazing, all in the same day. Storms would confine you for weeks. Uh, you had to share very close quarters. There was three guys shared one circular room and three bunk beds, which you had no privacy, which was kind of difficult at times. It was a very noisy place because we constantly had diesel generators running for electricity. And between that and waves pounding all the time, it was quite noisy. But it, it was an absolutely amazing thing to work in such a, a wonderful, architecturally beautiful lighthouse. And until I left the service, I didn't realize so many people knew about the fastnet because we got we saw very few people out there you get a few yachts that might stop off in the summer and give you a newspaper or some fresh fruit or chocolate or something but in my time out there we only ever had one person who landed there and it happened to be a woman which was quite enjoyable <laughs> yeah, yeah i didn't see a whole lot of women out there <laughs> no we didn't <laughs> just a lot of ugly sailors <laughs> yeah but, seals yeah, maybe Amazing experience. It's yeah. it's hard to describe, but when you first land on it, you realize you're out in the middle of nowhere, stuck in a tower. Uh, you can't go anywhere. If the seas are rough, you can't walk anywhere because you're trapped in the tower. It was it was probably one of the harder stations to be stationed on in Ireland. Isn't there a, a famous uh, race uh, boating race every year that actually goes around Fastnet? Yes, it's called the Fastnet Yacht Race. It comes from England, and um, it's quite famous. The keepers there used to monitor all the yachts passing by. And so one time there was a big disaster because there was a massive hurricane hit. Lots of yachts sank, and the keepers spent three or four days relaying mayday messages and trying to help. I imagine the landing at Fastnet and some of the other uh, rock lighthouses uh, where you worked must have been a real challenge. Yes, uh, it would depend on the sea usually. There was times when it was flat calm, you could just step out in the boat landing. 
but that would be sort of one percent at a time. But uh, before helicopters landing on the rock stations in the southwest coast of Ireland was um, very dangerous, uh, extremely difficult, and you'd need a lot of experience to gauge wave, waves and things to get guys on without drowning. Uh, we would climb into a bosun's chair, and the lighthouse keeper on the rock would wind like a lunatic and try and get you up high and swing you into the boat landing. It was a major operation back in those days. And then in the 60s, they brought in helicopters, which made it a lot easier for us because we would just land on the rock. But it, they were very difficult places for helicopters to land on as well. Yeah. Uh, you'd get updrafts, which would stop the helicopter from landing, so they'd have to put full force in the engines to force the helicopter down. But for the last 150 feet, the updrafts would disappear. And if the pilot wasn't paying attention, he'd hit the the landing pad an awful bang nearly <laughs> break the engines very skilled pilots got us out there i imagine so i you know looked at pictures of fastnet and i was trying to think of where there you know is there room to land a helicopter out there there couldn't have been a yes they, they built um a storeroom on the base of the rock and the top of the storeroom was basically the helipad but you had to be careful there as well because sometimes you get a rogue wave would come up it would bash off the lighthouse but if it threw up enough spray, it would drown the helicopter and the engines would cut out and that's the end of all of us. You, you had to be very, very careful. It wasn't a place for mistakes. Yeah, I guess not. Do you know of any incidents in the history of Fastnet? Were there any deaths of people getting on and off of there, anything like that? When they built it, there was a few people drowned. Amazingly enough, there wasn't too many cases of keepers getting into trouble. The odd occasion you might get dunked in the sea in the middle of winter, and that was pretty chilly. But um, I don't know of anybody who actually died. There was accidents on board um, on the lighthouse. I had one myself when um, we had an engine failure one night. I went out to restart the engines, and they wouldn't start electrically, so I had to manually start them. And um, when I turned the crank handle on the engine, it took off and spun, but there was oil on my hands and it slipped out of my hands. So it spun at 2000 revs a minute and hit me in the leg. Ugh. Put quite a big dent in my the bones in my leg and I was flown ashore the next day. Wow. But I spent two weeks in crutches, but I still have my leg. I still yeah. have a dent in the bone as well. <laughs> wow. Wow. But it didn't break. No, it didn't. No, but it hurt. <laughs> yeah. Does it still hurt you? And no, it doesn't. No, but when I run my finger over it, I can feel the indentation where it is. Wow. At Fastnet, how many men were typically assigned there when you were there? Each lighthouse in Ireland had a crew of six. There was three on each month, and we'd overlap every two weeks. You'd change one or two. So there was always somebody on there who had been on with the previous two weeks. So if there was any problems, they could explain to the guys coming out. But um, they used to have families living on many of the lighthouses in Ireland. The last one, I think, was 1982 or three. At the, that was the Bailey Lighthouse. But there was never families on the Fastnet. There was no room. But some of the other rock stations, like the Skelligs, there used to be families on them. Well, that sounds like a, a pretty good system. So you're saying that there were typically three men on at any one time. Yeah. Were you ever left alone at Fastnet or any of the other lighthouses? No, they always had to have three on them. Uh, on occasion, you might have somebody who'd have an accident or got sick, and they couldn't get another guy out quick enough, and you might be left with two. Right. But for safety's sake, you always had to have three. Were you at Fastnet for any major storms? And if so, could you tell us about it? Yes, the very um, first day I landed there, the sea was nice and calm. We landed in a helicopter that night, a massive storm hit us, and it scared the living hell out of me. <laughs> because what happens is the, the, the tower itself is exposed to the southwest swells, and you can hear them coming towards you. And they pound in at the base of the lighthouse and it races up the tower and goes right over the lantern sometimes. But your bedroom is halfway up the tower. So you can hear yourself going under the water because it gets very quiet. Ugh. And then the wave recedes, you can hear the noise on the outside again. So it's pretty scary when you're a new guy out there. <laughs> it was very hard to sleep because of the noise. But you get used to it, and once you realize the tower was pretty strong, it wasn't going to be washed away, you kind of got used to it. But um, I think one of the hardest parts during the storms is being trapped inside. You couldn't get fresh air, so it was kind of difficult. Did Fastnet have a fog signal? Yes, it had uh, super, an electric super typhoon. 
could, they couldn't put uh, an air compressed siren or diaphone because there's no room to put air tanks or, or massive air compressors. So they just used an electric one. And we had three engines in the engine room uh, to give us power. So I imagine you turned on the fog signal at certain times when you, was there like a, a point you looked out for? And if at that point disappeared, you turned on the, the horn? Yes. Um, According to Irish Lights regulations, once the visibility drops below three miles, you're supposed to turn on the fog signal. Mm -hmm. But when you're sort of five or six miles out at sea, it's hard to gauge that. So we used to use the nearest island, which is about four miles away, Cape Clear Island. And if we couldn't see that, we turned on the fog signal. Another famous lighthouse where you spent some time, light station, was the Hookhead Lighthouse in southeastern Ireland, uh, which is the oldest operating lighthouse in the world. And uh, I imagine when you went there, did, did you have a, an idea of the tremendous history there? Well, I knew it was very old, but I didn't realize it was the oldest one in the world at the time. The minute you walk into the tower, you know it was ancient because there's an old church inside in it and there used to be um, cells where the monks used to punish themselves and the windows were little slits like you'd have in a castle for shooting arrows out of. But it was, yeah, it was a very old place. And on the top of the old tower, we had the new tower, which was pretty new. It was only 200 years old. And that's where the lens was and the light. But the history there is amazing. And we used to, all, we used to spend our watches in a modern control tower outside the old tower. It was a bit like a control tower for airlines, you know, for air traffic control. Mm -hmm. That's where we used to spend our watches usually. You mentioned to me, you mentioned that you had a little accident. At Hookhead? Yes. The archways and the doors in the tower are really low because people, the monks 800 years ago were very small people. And um, I'm quite tall. So when I was running up the stairs in the dark when the electricity went out due to a power failure, I was trying to get the light working and I ran straight into a concrete overhang and knocked myself clean out. <laughs> I don't know how long I was out for, but when I woke up, I went up and started the light again. I imagine you might have had a concussion, but maybe weren't really aware of it at the time. But I had like... no idea. All I know is my head hurt. <laughs> yeah. Well, you also mentioned that Hookhead could be kind of spooky at night. Did you feel it was haunted? Well, I didn't feel it was haunted, but it was very creepy in there at night. First of all, it's it's huge inside there. It's very dark, very narrow, uh, very badly lit. The only lights in the tower at night are a, a bulb every sort of, you know, four or 500 feet that leads up the stairs. And it was extremely damp and the wind would make strange noises. It wasn't a place you'd spend a lot of time in at 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it, it was very creepy. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think it was haunted, but you don't think try to think of those things at night when you're on your own. <laughs> right. Well, Plus, I, I was young and stupid. These things didn't bother me then. <laughs> yeah, I, it's anything really ancient like that that has uh, so much history, especially having a long period of monks uh, running the place and everything. It, I don't think I'd want to be in there at 4 a.m. I'm wondering if there are any other interesting, you know, especially memorable things ab about Hookhead. Yeah, it was the only lighthouse on the coast to have a radar. And we used to use that for monitoring the automatic Conning Beg lightship, which is about 10 miles from us, uh, to make sure it was on position. That was kind of interesting because it was the first time I ever came across and used radar especially when you were in a static position and you're not moving. The other things then were um, probably just the architecture of the whole building. It was so old and huge compared to other lighthouses. Okay. It was also an extremely fog-prone area, so the fog signal would be running for days at a time, and that would really get you down from days in, day out of a wailing siren or a diaphone. I can't remember which they had there, but it was very loud. I imagine was it hard to sleep? Yes, it would be. Yeah, uh, it was very difficult. But you got used to sleeping with fog signals, um, and the thirty seconds between each blast, uh, you'd manage to fall asleep. And when the other keeper would turn off the fog signal, you'd wake up because of the silence. Right. Let's talk about the Skelligs light station for a while. For us uh, Americans that aren't too familiar with uh, Irish geography, first of all, where is the Skelligs? Uh, they're 
two rocks off the southwest coast of Ireland, off the Kerry coast. They're about eight and a half miles out. Mm -hmm. And um, one of them is a huge bird sanctuary. The other one is an even bigger rock called Skelly Michael, which is the, where the lighthouse is. And there used to be two lighthouses there in the old days. There's only one now. It's a very weird, strange place. It, uh, it was actually, it's been used in a lot of movies and it was used in the Star Wars movie recently. And it has a monastery in the very top of it from the early Christian era and where the monks used to live in stone huts and at the age of starvation, they thought this made them very devout. I thought they were nuts myself. But um, so there's a lot of history there. It's also a bird sanctuary. So there was millions of puffins and gannets there in the summer months. Mm. And you used to have thousands of visitors would come out in the summer months, which is also very interesting. And you could get fresh food pretty easy. <laughs> Well, the visitors coming more for the wildlife or for the lighthouse or both? Um, most of them didn't even know there was a lighthouse there mm -hmm. because the light in its position wasn't really seen from the mainland. It was only seen from the sea. And most people back in those days didn't know much about lighthouses. So they used to come out for the uh, beehive huts and the birds. You mentioned that Skellig's station could also be kind of spooky at night. Yes, it, it was one of the few places that made me feel a bit uneasy at night because you used to hear what sounded like footsteps coming down the stairs or approaching the door to the kitchen then the door would open but there'd be nobody there and on occasions you'd be up in your bedroom and you'd hear somebody coming up the steps right to the your door of, mm. door of your bedroom and you'd get up and you'd go out and there's nobody there wow. so it was a bit creepy yeah i'd say that qualifies as creepy for sure yeah the older keepers used to tell the young guys, probably scared them, that it was the spirits of long dead monks roaming around the lighthouse at night. Yeah, well, maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, you mentioned gravestones at Skelligs. What was that about? When the Skelligs was first built, there was families living out there. And one of the keepers' wives, she had, um, she had a total of nine children and four of them died on the Skelligs. So they're buried right next to the lighthouse and, and on the, in a small grave, which is kind of sad. The same woman was transferred to Inishon in County Donegal, where she buried another five children. So she lost nine out of 11 children. Wow. So Skelligs, as you mentioned before, is very remote. It's about eight miles offshore. What was uh, life like there? Was it maybe a little better than Fastnet or how did, how did those compare? Yes, it, the the newer lighthouse was pretty modern. It was a comfortable station. There was plenty of room in it. You could walk around. Uh, we each had our own bedroom on light the fastnet. You had a monastery up on the top of the rock for roaming around the birds, the visitors. Uh, and most keepers liked it, and it was a nice place to be stationed. The helicopters could land there relatively easy. Uh, I was never delayed in getting off, so it was it was very pleasant. Another lighthouse where you were stationed was Bull Rock. You mentioned that earlier. That was one of your inspirations for becoming a lighthouse keeper. That's uh, also way offshore from uh, the southwest corner of Ireland. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it's off of Castletown Bear, which is a fishing port in the West Cork region and the southwest coast of Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's very far out and um, very remote. Most people never knew about it. It's... Um, it's a very interesting place, and one night, we about 1 a.m., we got hit by lightning, mm. which actually blew a two-foot hole in a thick concrete bunker, mm. and it, all the monitoring lights for the lighthouse actually exploded, and all the bul bulbs burst. Oh, wow. The entire place reeked of sulfur, and as you walked around outside, the hairs in the back of your neck would stand up. There was so much static electricity. Mm. The light itself kept working because it was hit, but it also had um, a lightning conductor on it, whereas the bunker that got hit is just a bunker. It didn't have a, a lightning conductor, but it was only about 30 feet from the where we were sitting. Wow. So it actually made us all jump out of our chairs pretty so. quick. That's pretty scary. What else was memorable about Bull Rock? The Bull Rock is just this massive hump of a rock. It's about, I think it's about 300 feet tall. 
Uh, it has very little access to the water because it's sheer cliffs all around. And there's a, a huge natural tunnel that runs right through the rock, that you can actually sail a trawler through it's so big. And um, that was kind of interesting. I went through it on a boat one time, didn't tell the principal keeper. I just jumped on a fishing boat that was passing by, went through, and had a hell of a job getting back onto the lighters because <laughs> the seas had gotten rough. So I, I nearly got myself into a lot of trouble. But nowadays you can actually get a rib boat tour that goes around the Bull Rock, and it goes right through the tunnel if the seas are cooperate. So that's quite fascinating. Yeah. I think I saw a picture of that when I was looking for information on the internet, tour boat going through. The Bull Rock also had an experimental wave generator, which was installed in the 1980s by the Cork University to do research on alternative energy. So the keepers used to do take daily readings and send them via computer to the university. And this is the first time any of us had ever seen a computer so that was an experience for us. And we had to send the messages through with computer code, which, <laughs> which took a long time for each word had dozens of letters and numbers. And we had to make sure we got it right. So it would take us about an hour to send a sentence. <laughs> that wave generator lasted about three or four months and then it was washed away in a major storm. And they never put a new one in. So it all the Bull Rock also had the loudest fog signal on the coast. Mm. It was a siren. And it was so loud, everything would vibrate, the whole rock. And I actually think the tunnel on the rock echoed the sound around even more. You could hear it like about seven or eight miles away, which is unusual for a fog signal. Yeah. And actually, one of the strangest things I ever came across in the has happened on the Bull Rock. We had dense fog for about a week. And in the middle of the day, I went out checking to, around the station to make sure everything was okay. And the fog pulled back, and I had a clear tunnel of about a couple of hundred feet that stretched five miles to the mainland and I could see the mainland. There was dense fog all around me. Wow. Ship sailed right through that little gap. You'd see the bow get clear of the fog and the bow go back into the fog and then you'd see the bridge and then that would disappear. Then a few minutes later it just closed in again. Wow. It was like marching of the Red Sea. Yeah, was... right. It's a strange phenomenon there. So another lighthouse where you were stationed on the south coast of Ireland was Mizzenhead, M-I-Z-E-N, is that, do you pronounce it Mizzenhead? Yes, Mizzenhead, just yeah. like the mast on a ship. Okay. I understand there was a memorable boat accident that happened there? Yes, it's probably the most famous boat rescue we had in the lighthouse service. Uh, one night when I was in duty about 1 a.m., the Irish Prime Minister's yacht crashed into us in dense fog. And I was the one that picked up the Mayday and myself and another keeper scaled the cliffs there trying to rescue them, but we couldn't get them up the cliffs. So they were in a very narrow bay. So we left them there and we got the lifeboat and guided it in to pick them up. But it was extremely dangerous trying to find them because Mizzenhead is all sheer cliffs. And I nearly fell off the cliffs a few times, you know, trying to find where they were located. But they all survived. Yeah, after that, then the Prime Minister closed down the lighthouse service and demanded all the lighthouses. That was our thanks. <laughs> oh, wow. So that was, we're talking about what, what year that that happened? Uh, 1985. Wow. So that, I imagine you were in the newspapers because of that. Yes, it was all over the radio and the newspaper. And, of course, in typical newspapers, they were looking for gossip. But I valued my job, so <laughs> I didn't say too much to them. Part two of the two-part interview with Richard Cummins will be available in two days on February 3rd, and it's just as fascinating as part one. I always enjoy talking to ex-keepers to get first-hand stories of what life was like at the lighthouses before automation, and it's a treat to speak with former keepers from other countries like Richard. For anyone who missed it, you might want to check out the interview with Ian Duff, a former keeper in Scotland, in episode 79. Many thanks to all the members and volunteers of the U.S. Lighthouse Society in this country and around the world. And a shout out to the Society staff at the Point No Point Light Station in Hansville, Washington. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about everything the Society offers. Donations and memberships help make this podcast possible and also support the Society's mission of preserving lighthouses and fostering public awareness. We've been doing this podcast for about 20 months now, and I want to thank all our faithful listeners. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, anything you can do to help spread the word is greatly appreciated. If you know anyone who's interested in lighthouses, please tell them about it. You can also find news related to the podcast on the U.S. Lighthouse Society's social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And there is also a new separate Facebook page for the podcast Lighthearted. And if you listen using the Apple Podcasts app, please rate and review us. The author Virginia Woolf once said, quote, Lighthouses are endlessly suggestive signifiers of both human isolation and our ultimate connectedness to each other, unquote. Before we wrap up here, I just want to say that we would like our listeners to be involved in the podcast. You can always email comments, ideas, or questions to me at Jeremy, that's J-E-R-E-M-Y, Jeremy at USLHS.org. Also, we're offering a chance for you, our listeners, to be part of this podcast. We invite our listeners to record their own show opening, and we will use them on the podcast. All you have to say is, quote, This is Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is, insert name here, now here's the host of Lighthearted, Jeremy Dontremont, unquote. And you can email your recording to me as a wave, that's W-A-V, or MPEG, that's M-P-G, file, at jeremy at uslhs.org. We plan to come up with other ways for our listeners to get involved in the podcast soon. So, as always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little